of late there have been a lot of questions which are asked on a topic which seem to be of an unknown origin. Now this is a, an issue particularly with geography and there are a lot of questions that are asked from some of these type of sources which look like from where have they been asked. Like once the deal went on to ask about Compace, although anyone who will go to study geographical thought they will come to know about it. What they are also doing is that they are going to be picking up uh, topics like Thyssen polygons, that is one of the ways of uh, regionalization of a place. Uh, they may going to be asked about, uh, they may going to be asking on locational triangle only, which is uh, a very small component of Weberian uh, industrial location analysis as well. Now, other than that, uh, other than bloating certain type of topics, uh, which are readily very small topics, uh, readily such type of topics uh, which are uh, only certain type of points. Uh, Sometime back they used to be only used as points. Uh, now they are full blown topics. Uh. Now this is one component of uh, questions of unknown origin. There are other components as well which can go on to be, uh, which can go on to classify it uh, of unknown origin. For example, Thinking that there has been something that has taken place between India and China with respect to Doklam Cha, then uh, in this case, uh, the question that can go on to be asked about the nature of the terrain, how is it that India goes on to hold a either tactical advantage or a strategic advantage with respect to Doklam Cha? Maybe they will go on to ask about terrain. Maybe the, is it that uh, going to be uh, if it is going to be automobile industry, we are going to ask only about uh, why is it going to be only in the southern part of the country. If it is going to be about let's say behavioral revolution, uh, then uh, in this behavioral revolution they have asked uh, questions uh, related to uh, many aspects. But one of these topics that can be asked related to it uh, is going to be associated uh, with uh, uh, maybe why geography has a psychological component or psychology going to be having a geographical component in this case. Uh, then uh, maybe uh, two or three of these topics say if about the migration then one can go on to think of uh, that the bloating will go on to take place only on European migration crisis. Uh, maybe it is going to be only about EIA and only one component of it. So all in all uh, as I have known the students are facing difficulty as to how exactly to anticipate one type of a question. How exactly is it that some of these type of questions can be anticipated? So it is in this series of anticipated questions uh, we have uh, picked up uh, one of these which are going to be critical questions uh, which can go on to be of a critical nature. The second has been on the perspective. The third is going to be on the questions from known origin. Uh, and of course the fourth is some series of conventional questions uh, which can possibly be asked. Uh, so. These uh, four components uh, along with a uh, discussion of uh, something like some uh, hundred odd questions uh, may go on to solve a good amount of a problem of the candidates with respect to what they have to write and what they don't have to write. Now picking up this section on uh, and this series on some questions of unknown origin for 2017. Uh, we must go on to let the students know that uh, we are uh, only talking about understanding of the questions, uh, presenting them in the form of answers uh, and uh, these are only directives, not a complete answer. It is assumed that with the help of these directives, uh, a student will be able to form a complete uh, answer for themselves. Uh, it's a trick, it is a directive, it's a suggestion, it's an advisory. It is an indication, it is anything but not an answer. Because in order to pick up an answer, we have to pick up the entire of introduction, the main body, and then the tail of it. And this is something, if that is going to be done, that is going to be really, really time taking. It's going to be advantageous to the student because the student will be able to understand it only by way of indication and only by way of these directives what all that he has to put in a this question, this answer rather and and also that he will be able to understand in what direction is it that some of these contents and concepts and analysis and language has to be depicted, presented and, and presented in this case.
the first question that is going to be picked up in this case is going to be number number one the study of the nature of terrain would play a major role in any strategic advantage india and china want to have elaborate of course that is elaboration now understand this question the study of the nature of terrain eh, would play a major part in any strategic advantage that india and china want to have so in any type of a warfare even though it is going to be tactical in nature india and china can go on to have a lot of similarities a lot of dissimilarities and the war is that is going to be if at any point of a time that is going to be is going to be a symmetric warfare in most of these pockets so whether it goes on to mean chumbi valley whether it goes on to mean barahuti whether it is going to be nilang jadang whether it is going to mean tibet whether it goes on to be in a, in a samdurum chola in any of these places it is only going to be in a symmetric warfare now in this symmetric warfare the most important factor that may go on to come to reduce the casualties in both the sites is the nature of the terrain it is a because of the nature of the terrain that uh, india has uh, not been able to defend a good amount of a territory to begin with on a very macro level one can understand that china is on a, going to be on a plateau india is going down now china's main population is going to be far removed away from the plateau region so china with the help of a uh, all of these missiles and its ammunition and its warfare can go to target the indian population while while india in order to target the chinese population has to reach far to the eastern coast of china so that's not going to be easy now in every type of a terrain it is going to be what are the tactical advantage and strategic advantage that india and china can go on to both have with respect to the terrain take an example of the klamcha india was on a higher level chinese were on going to lower side now what the chinese wanted to do was that they go wanted to move from one side to come to face and face with them the indian army in that place bhutanese army to begin with them it wanted to come to this region face to face eh? so that eh, they can go to negate that tactical advantage and strategic advantage that india was likely to have so because india was on a higher level and chinese on the on the lower ground it was offering a massive tactical advantage to india in sikkim as well as in chumbi valley region where the indians could have pulverized the chinese so in order to negate this advantage the chinese wanted to have a better location of sorts now terrain goes on to play a major role in this case that is that is one component now in a in a second manner as well you can go on to pick up a pick up the case of a, some regions like that of tibetan region the terrain does go on to play a major role and it is only because uh, the terrain doesn't going to give an absolute advantage to the chinese that india has uh, been holding its position uh, in a uh, siachen so that in siachen it can go on to see both of its enemies on one side china and on the other side is going to be pakistan uh, and it can go to target both of them of course in order to negate it india has the chinese have again gone on to build the karakoram highway and it is a marvel of sorts we repeat it it's a real real marvel of sorts in this case yeah. so the study of terrain eh, will be a major part in any strategic india and china want to have we have picked up two examples you are likely to pick up two three four five six examples here eh. one from arunachal pradesh another from sikkim another from balahuti nilang jadhang and so on second is and as we said that all of these answers are going to be indicative they are going to be directives say eh, so that the students can go to approach them easily the second is magnetic field changes have the potential to completely throw the laws of atmosphere physics and biotic life out of gear that is that means it's it's simple simple in the sense it's structured the magnetic field changes have the potential to throw the laws of atmosphere physics and biotic life first let's begin with physics magnetic field change will go to imply two things first is 
that is uh, the geomagnetic equator will go on to shift itself uh, from uh, maybe Alaska to Iceland, uh, maybe to uh, Siberia, maybe to uh, maybe to some of these islands in that Murmansk uh, and then towards a uh, far eastern side. That's a possibility. Second part of magnetic field change is going to be associated with uh, the weakening of the magnetic field. That is a uh, the north magnetic field will go to get weakened, the southern magnetic field will go to get weakened. The third component is going to be associated with uh, its a uh, shift. That is, uh, the north pole will go to become south pole and the south pole will go to become north pole. So that is going to be asserted with the shift of it. And because it goes on to be asserted with the shift of it, uh, consequently, first the value of G will go on to change. So it will go on to throw the laws of physics out of gear. It will also go on to throw the laws of atmosphere. And how is it so? Because uh, the atmosphere, that is the whole of the earth, is going to be protected by a layer that we're going to be calling it by the name of magnetosphere. And uh, all of this solar energy that comes uh, onto the earth, that goes on to pass through the magnetosphere. And it is passing through, the, in order to pass through the magnetosphere, uh, that uh, it uh, undergoes uh, the depletion of uh, its uh, intense solar radiation. And when we go to be talking about that it undergoes a depletion of intense solar radiation, it basically means it basically means that the alpha, beta, gamma rays will be depleted, the X rays will be depleted, and the UV rays will also be depleted. That is the removal of the magnetosphere because of a change in the magnetic field will go on to throw every type of a such will go on to throw atmosphere out of gear, and all of these rays will start a landing on the earth and as they start landing on the earth of course this is precisely what will going to happen as they start landing on the earth in the process of landing on the earth they will going to destroy any amount of abiotic life everyone will go on to start suffering from a radiation bombardment all of these plants all of these animals will going to wither away and die we have explained that part that's the second question the third is explain the origin of Chard Lake and its extinction, which caused the initiation of desertification process in Africa. What impact it had on the climate of African Amazon Basin? So, Chard Lake was one of those places that was a, the site of a sea some time back. In Sahara, the place where this Chard Lake is right now, it was having a vast, majestic sea. And of course, eh, the whole of the region was going to be very, very rich in terms of water resources. It was not too long ago that the region was going to be rich in terms of water resources. But as with climate, climates always keep on changing. And at that point of time, it was not human beings to be blamed. It was not global warming also to be blamed. It changed because it had to change. So, maybe that uh, there was a crack uh, in the terrain uh, of the region and that allowed all of this water to seep through and go on to become dried. That was one. Second is, Chard Lake is going to be a depression and the base of it is going to be occupied by a rocky terrain. It doesn't going to be having a, a lot of sediments in that place. It's a rocky terrain. It's very shallow. To an extent uh, that uh, if rain goes on to fall over this region, over Bodola Depression and Chard Lake, uh, the whole of this uh, lake goes on to have a very, very large uh, aerial expanse. Uh, and then as the rainfall, as the water evaporates, it shrinks as much. So its expansion, shrinkage keeps on taking place. Now there were some reasons uh, why is it that uh, the lake Chard, uh, that is, uh, uh, why is it that uh, there was a water body that went on to become extinct? It may have been because of a climate change. It may have been because uh, of uh, some type of crack that went on to develop in this region. It may have also been because of the fact uh, that all the water got itself evaporated from this region, from a terrain that was going to be very, 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 very shallow. And there are distinct, uh, there are distinct evidences uh, to this effect uh, in the whole of the Sahara also. Pick up eh? the second one, the, the origin of the Chard Lake. Now, origin of Chard Lake is uh, only because of the fact that it's a depression and uh, all the water accumulates from the adjoining regions. Eh? One or two small rivers that go to drain it eh, into, into it. Eh? It's a region of a centripetal drainage. Eh? So, a good amount of eh, drainage goes on to find itself by eh, concentrating on the central part of it. That is Lake Chard. 
that is the origin of it so it's a region of centripetal drainage the whole of the region goes on to having a rocket terrain that doesn't going to allow the water to percolate and uh, any amount of rain that allows the whole of the lake eh, to become a lake of sorts eh. so what caused the uh, which co uh, what exactly caused the initiation of desertification process in africa now if we imagine that uh, any lake that would have been a uh, of the size of a uh, maybe 10 times the larger the size of lake chad eh, and that went on to get dried up eh, there must have been some eh, massive factors eh. And there are evidences that the water level was this much or this much and so on and so forth because there are going to be some type of structures. Some of these structures are even man-made as well which go on to readily show that the level of water in these places was much more than what it is right now. So possibly it may have been initiated by possible that is that is a deforestation possible because of a crack possible because of some type of a climatic change possible because of evaporation exceeding rainfall in this region so that went on to get dried up because it was a sea it was a shallow sea it got dried up all of the all of these phytoplankton like a globigerina like a teropod like a foraminifera all of them they also went on to sink on the floor of the ocean and as they went on to sink on the floor of the ocean these were nutrients essentially these were nutrients and they're going to form a very thin veneer over the top of the sahara now sahara normally undergoes a certain type of bouts of wind blown particles being blown away mixed with the atmosphere and that is blown away in different parts so it is going to be in some small territory through which the wind is responsible for blowing all of this uh, globigerina, foraminifera, pteropod, uh, which have been lying on the base of the Sahara to as far a place as a mason basin. And these act as a nutrient for a mason basin. And because they're going to be acting as a nutrient in the mason basin, uh, consequently, they are the one which have been responsible for uh, such a dense vegetation and such a rich reservoir and repertoire of uh, vegetation and biodiversity in Amazon Basin. Now, this is what how exactly it had had on the climate of uh, African Amazon Basin because it is these blown up particles uh, that have led to the evolution of this forest area. Fourth is a major biospheric event has been the reptilian extinction. Explain its causes, mechanism and evidences. Now extinction, we are talking about extinction and we are talking about six extinction. So there can be a question on the six extinction. There can be a question on extinction eh, because eh, we do go on to be having eh, a topic called as a eh, biosphere ecosystem eh, and extinction impact on the biosphere, eh, biodiversity and eh, they can always go on to take you back to some of these type of extinctions. Eh, that's a possibility and because uh, KT boundary had been in news that is Cretaceous tertiary boundary had been in news uh, consequently this is likely to be asked. So major bio biospheric event has been that of reptilian extinction. The answer must go on to begin with the fact uh, that uh, there was one event uh, that was responsible for the extinction of the reptiles. That was a major biospheric event. So one of these events that were responsible for the extinction of the reptiles eh, took place eh, during the end of Cretaceous. That is what we are going to be calling it KT boundary. It was eh, a series of events eh, that led to the KT extinction. The cause can go on to be one of them is associated with a uh, meteoritic impact. Eh. Another is going to be associated with diseases eh. and another is going to be associated with uh, the morphological adaptation of these reptiles. Now beginning with the first one, come what may be, the reptiles had to become extinct largely because they had gone on to over evolve themselves. That means the dinosaurs, particularly some of the some of these type of dinosaurs like the brontosaurus had gone on to evolve to such a height, such a large size that it is this size that had gone on to become and uh, that is going to become a uh, uh, rather un, un evolutionary of such. Now, with such a large site, it is difficult to maintain the size of this body for any type of an organism. 
and to say it in the form of an exaggeration or an analogy that is if the dinosaur's tail used to be chopped off then the dinosaur used to realize after a week well what happened to my tail now that is what exactly has been the case in this case here that's what exactly has been a, the condition in this case all in all now that has been one factor now second has been a, that is a biospheric uh, evolution had taken place in a different manner as well that most of the dinosaurs had gone to become either over specialized uh, a reptiles had gone to become over specialized and they have gone to become over generalized now when you're going to become over specialized and you're going to be feeding only on one plant anything going to go wrong with that plant and you're going to become extinct over generalized that means it goes on to increase competition to such a large extent that you're not in a position to deal with it that is going to be over generalized in this case yeah. so it's going to be both of them that's one component the second reason has been associated with uh, meteoritic impact now meteoritic impact can go on to trigger a host of events first of all it will go on to it can go on to cause a, an atmospheric explosion an atmospheric implosion then a, a shock wave then as it goes on to collide it will go on to lead to a volcanic activity unimaginable to any extent if it hits the water body it will go on to lead to a mega tsunami and then the shock waves that are going to get generated because of it in the radiation that emanates eh, that has the potential to to uh, kill anything anything that is existing on the earth and this is what may have happened with this reptiles eh. so a series of events eh. first a meteoritic impact eh, then eh, a hole in the atmosphere then an implosion the vaporization eh, then a shock wave eh, volcanic activity and the aftermath of a volcanic activity that may have been a seed rain and associated with a host of events like a mega tsunami that may have killed the reptilian cell and the third is an epidemic one epidemic because it was an over generalized population then any form of an epidemic that may have taken place that would have wiped out the entire of the reptilian population other than that there were other factors like the eggs were eaten away by the other one for example brontosaurus eggs were eaten away by the tyrannosaurus so they started in fighting with each other imagine any situation and any condition that would have gone on to become a non beneficial for the uh, for the habitat of a, for a healthy habitat of the reptiles and that was there the evidence is that for everything for example that meteoritic impact took place eh, its evidence is going to be found in certain things like eh, there is a thin layer of iridium eh, on eh, the kt boundary then eh, because the radiation level was going to be so high in the femur of the dinosaurs eh, there is indeed eh, a very high concentration of radioactivity the third is of course there are significant evidences that there had been a meteoritic leak as well which went on to Form because of such type of an explosion, so that has been a part of it, part and parcel of it. That is uh, the fifth, fourth question. The fifth is migration has the potential to induce secularization as well as break the fabric of the society. Explain with examples. Simplified, this question means uh, migration has the potential to induce. Uh, to bring about certain type of changes for example one change is that it will go on to make the people think very very independently because they go on to get a hosts of people with a different type of culture and so much amount of admixture of culture lifestyle civilization thinking perspective uh, viewpoints uh, wisdom knowledge information lifestyles go on to merge uh, that uh, people indeed start a uh, non sticking to any type of a lifestyle and they start following a much more much more cosmopolitan lifestyle much more independent lifestyle a much more liberated lifestyle of sorts and when you go on to become liberated when you go on to become independent to such an extent that you are by and large free of other worldly aspects that is what is secularization so secularization can be induced by migration by the migrants who come from different parts of the world and go on to bring with them different types of uh, lifestyle civilization thinking perspective uh, logic uh, words uh, expressions uh, and everything
that is part of it. The second is that migrants as they come, uh, what they're going to do is that they again going to bring different type of lifestyles there. Uh, and depending on whether the population is receptive or not, whether they're going to merge with this existing society or not, uh, and uh, whether they're going to be a part of this society or not, uh, they may go on to start eating up the jobs. They may start competing with the jo for the jobs. Uh, they may start inserting a, a lot of elements in the culture and in the landscape uh, that may be inimical to the interest of the host society. So that may go on to break the fabric of the society as well. Now, examples for it can be, you can go on to pick up uh, some of these examples uh, from a uh, from Iceland. That is, Icelandic people, there have been good number of people who have gone to Iceland eh? and eh, there is, the culture in that place is really, really, really cosmopolitan. In one part of Britain where also migrants have been, eh, then eh, that has gone to become a true society of sorts eh, with so much amount of a diversity. In some other place, in the same place in Britain itself, eh, the people who have been there, they have not been able to mix with the population. Eh? Some people do go on to perceive that they are eating away their jobs, they are competing with them and what it has done is that it has broken the fabric of the society also in those regions. Most of these things are likely to take place in Islamic country because the most of the Islamic people are by and large very intolerant of anything that can go on to happen. Indeed, it is India only which has been able to withstand the onslaught of such type of such type of uh, Islamization eh? because any of these countries in the world eh, where the population went on to increase to 10 percent, 15 percent, ultimately, ultimately Islam was able to colonize it eh, by increasing their population to 25 percent, 30 percent, 40 percent and then eh, they almost usurped the entire of the country. North African countries, Arabian countries are all part of it. Eh? That has started eh, happening with Europe as well now. Six is the Hartland theory is a Hartland theory is this understood why the Russian industrial region required a shift. Elaborate the inbuilt mechanism into relationship. Now the first thing is that one has to explain the Hartland theory. So Hartland theory was that there it was a Hartland that means uh, the whole of a uh, Russia has been uh, called by this name, built by this name that was that is Hartland. It has been called by this name, it has been built by this name, which has been called by the name of Heartland. Now, because it has been called and built by the name Heartland, it basically because of the fact that it is surrounded by mountains from every possible side. So on the southern side, you have Caucasus that goes on to move towards the Hindu Kush, then that goes on to move to Pamir. Pamir emanates a series of mountains, Altintag, Kundunshan, then it goes on to be <coughs> Yablonoi Mountains, uh, Kingan Mountains, uh, Stanovoi Ranges, Zugzurokotsk Ranges, uh, Vorkhoyansk Ranges, Chosky Ranges towards the north, uh, moving all the way from the southern region towards the eastern region and then towards the northern region. From the northern region, the whole of this region is impassable. From the western side, it is Urals that doesn't go on to allow any type of a passage to it uh, except for a small part of an area that lies towards the south of uh, Urals. Uh. <coughs> that area that goes on to lie to the south of Ural, that is the only passageway for an entry into Heartland. That is what exactly was called by called by Mekinder. Now it says that uh, the Russian industrial region went on to shift uh, from a uh, west of Ural towards the east of Ural. Now why is it that it was uh, harmful to be in the western region of Ural? Was because uh, it was in 19 in the first partly part of 1900, 1916, 17, 14 to 16 of South Germans were able to pulverize the entire of uh, the eastern region of uh, of uh, Ural. Uh, that was an industrial region. So Russia had no option other than to shift it towards the west of it. Essentially, this is what Hartnett says that anything within the Hartnett is going to be very, very, very safe, uh, and anything outside is not going to be safer. So the theory is best understood because, because the Russians ultimately realized that, that the mountains went on to form an impassable region, they were impregnable and that the center of it was going to be, the center of it was going to be whole of 
Russia and because it was going to be whole of Russia in the center surrounded by mountains, rimmed by mountains, eh, if then the sea is going to shift from eh, the west of Iraq towards the east of Iraq, eh, that will go on to find itself safe. This is what was the inbuilt mechanism and the interrelationship between the heartland and that of eh, the Russian industrial region and the Second World War. Seventh is eh? explain thermohaline circulation as a means eh, and mechanism of energy balance and the possible disruption it faces from global warming. The first part is what is thermohaline circulation? So, thermohaline circulation is something that is associated with eh, the movement eh, of the seawater, the circulation of the oceans eh, induced by temperature and salinity. Thermo that is temperature, salinity that is haline thermohaline circulation as a means and mechanism of energy balance so it is in this manner that it is able to bring about some type of an energy balance here or there when it goes on to bring about certain type of an energy balance here and there that means in one way or the other <coughs> that basically goes on to imply and that basically goes on to mean eh, that such a type of energy balance eh, is significant for uh, maintaining uh, the heat uh, distribution over the whole of the earth and that is maintained by thermohaline circulation. So excessive amount of energy from the tropics finds its way to the polar regions and that's how exactly the thermohaline circulation is maintained. And because it is maintained the energy balance is also maintained from the tropics to the poles. Uh, the possible disruption it can go to face from global warming will be that is a uh, what can what global warming can go on to do is that it can go on to bring about a, a melting of the whole of the Greenland ice sheet and because it can go on to bring about a melting of the entire of the Greenlandic ice sheet the fresh water that will go to emanate out of it this fresh water will go to get itself spread out in the whole of this adjoining region now with a thin veneer of a fresh water over this region because the melting of the Greenland ice sheet the thermohaline circulation will go to get disrupted and it won't be able to carry the warm waters from uh, the tropics to the poles. So it will go to get itself disrupted or broken in between. Now, because uh, the whole of this region has a has a <coughs> the entire of the region has been responsible for spreading itself uh, in the and in spreading itself in the entire of the northern hemisphere what will going to do is that the northern hemisphere will going to become very 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 cold that is canada will going to freeze the temperature will going to drop to no less than something to 15 degrees centigrade from warm it is from what it is right now there can't be anything called as a summer season in canada at all even if it is going to be worth calling a summer season the entire of the northern portion of the united states will also going to freeze and for that matter, the whole of the uh, United States, uh, uh, north of Florida, is going to be freezing. Uh, it will go to freeze. Uh. Now, that is what exactly can go on to be the result of global warming if it is taking place. Uh, and that will be a disruption. It will go on to cause a uh, global cooling. Eighth is. Eighth question is. All geography has a psychological tinge and all psychology has a geographical base. Elucidate, simplify. <clears throat> All geography has a psychological tinge. That is, uh, if geography is uh, going to be about the study of the landforms, then then uh, you go on to study landforms and go on to know the significance of it. Uh, go on to know the role that it can go on to play. Go on to know how is it that you can go on to perceive perceive. That is because of psychology. Take another example. All geological components will also go on to have a psychological tinge in the way that is how is it that you go on to perceive that part. So the phenomena may be the same, but the interpretation of this phenomena may be different. The third is that the earth is laced with a beauty of climatic conditions, say, because it is climate that is going to be variable in every place and it keeps on changing, keeps on fluctuating. It is this change in this fluctuation that is the hallmark of a hallmark of climate. The only constant in climate, therefore, is what we're going to be calling it as change. That's the only 
component and that's the only consonant in this case that is its change. Now coming to another part of it. That is a vegetation also goes on to be having component. So whether whether you're going to consider vegetation as a hazard or it goes on to be a part of a beauty is again going to be having a psychological change. All of this natural phenomena that takes place, earthquake, consider is a phenomena, consider is a something of an experience of sorts. Eh? Of course, earthquakes don't go on to kill people. It's the buildings that go on to kill people because eh, if the buildings have not been properly made, they are bound to kill people. Same thing goes on to go with volcanoes. The same thing goes on to go with, uh, with tsunamis as well. So you don't go on to start living in a tsunami prone region. And if it, even if it is that you're going to live it, uh, you must go on to take a proper precaution to move away yourself away from that. How is it that you're going to perceive tsunami? Is it that you perceive tsunami as a, a way of a disaster or as, a, as something that goes on to clean the entire of the coastal environment is having a psychological tinge. Same is the case with floods. So floods are an event. Floods are a hazard that has a psychological tinge. So all geography has a psychological tinge. And all psychology has a geographical base. That means say, what exactly is our mentality? How is it that we're going to behave? Eh? How is it that we're going to respond to a situation? How is it that we're going to develop our culture? What is our lifestyle? This is dependent on geography. The people who are going to live in the plains eh, don't go on to behave in the same manner as the people going to be living in plateaus. Eh. The people who are going to be living in the mountainous areas also don't go on to believe it like the people who are going to be living in the flood plains. Eh. And eh, you will go on to appreciate this fact eh, that the people in the mountainous regions are going to be having a far greater degree of a cooperation with each other in comparison to people who are going to be living in the plains. Eh. Also, you can understand eh, that the people who are going to be living in eh, the shadows of uh, the sand dunes in Rajasthan, they are again going to be far more cooperative with each other, considering that these things have taken place eh? again because of the same factor. That is what we are going to be talking about. It goes on to be similar type of factor here as well. So it is uh, because of uh, it is because uh, people in different regions uh, can go on to behave differently. Their language is different. Their lifestyle is different. Their perception towards the outer world is different. Eh? Some people are very, very tolerant. Some people are not going to be tolerant. And that is because of the geography to a large extent. Ninth is <coughs> discuss the significance of GPI. Now, this is something that has already been discussed in some um, uh, earlier places. Eh? Uh, so, you can go to refer to it. That the question number nine, how is it that eh, it is a measure of economic development? This is something that has been Discuss. Refer to the previous one. That is a uh, the the type of question that are going to be very very tricky questions. How to answer tricky questions? That goes on to bring us on tenth. Analyze the role of localized orogenies and its impact on establishing India as a geological entity. Now there are three components: orogenies. Second is local orogenies. The third is how is it that it has led to the evolution of India as a geological entity? Now, understand this part. Origin refers to mountain building. And uh, this mountain building can go on to be localized. It can go to be very extensive as well. Extensive mountain building process going to include Himalayas. It can go on to include the Andes mountains. It can go on to be rocky mountains as well. And uh, the entire alpine Himalayan had been very, very extensive on a global scale. But having said that, there have been some of these origins that took place in the early part of the evolution of the earth eh, that have been very, very localized. Eh. So localized origins can go on to be examples taken of localized origin can be there is a that of Singhbhum, that of Dharwar, that is going to be Satpura, that is going to be Amgang, that is going to be Chhattisgarh, that is going to be Bastar and so on. In this case, they are going to be so on so forth. They all have been a localized origins. Now, origins go on to do, they do go on to have a role in welding two continents and welding two plates. For example, where the Himalayan origin took place, it was responsible for welding Tibet and that of India. That is Eurasian plate and Indian plate. Same goes with the Alpine origin. When it took place, it was responsible for welding both of them, that is Eurasian plate and that of 
Indian plate. And then uh, some of these mountains, that is the Zolin Mountains and other that took place, that was responsible for welding the Baltic Shield with the Siberian Shield. Karapetin Mountains have been an example of it. They have been responsible for welding them. Now that is what exactly is the role that is played by the mountains. So mountains are uh, origins go on to be accretion zones that allows uh, two continents to go undergo through accretion in these places. Now such an accretion is uh, responsible for uh, welding a lot of continents together. So there were several blocks in India. One of them was uh, Meghalaya, another was going to be Chotanagpur, another was going to be Dharwad, another was going to be that is a uh, the western part of it, that the Vindhyan, another was Rajasthan, another of it was going to be western Kratnik belt, another was going to be southern granulitic terrain. Now imagine, eh, there were so many of these type of terrains eh, along with the Vindhyan terrain, how is it that they went on to get welded? So one was because of Amgaon origin, so two small plates eh, were there and they went on to get welded because of the formation of a mountain origin. Then again both of them collided and that led to the formation of the third one. Then again they collided and uh, maybe Dharwar mountains led to the uh, led to the welding of uh, the northern granulitic terrain with the southern granulitic terrain. Then uh, again it was going to be the southern granulitic terrain that went on to get uh, welded to the Vindhan terrain uh, with the help of the Satpura mountains. Uh. It was again going to be the Bundelkhand terrain that went on to got itself uh, welded uh, along the Aravali mountains. Uh, by uh, by way of Aravali mountains. So it is these type of origins that have been responsible for allowing build India and all of these uh, smaller uh, smaller uh, geological terrains to get itself welded. This is what exactly the answer required. Question number 12. Give reasons for stubble burning in northwest part of India and prepare a draft measures to have a sustainable solution. There are three parts of the question. First is what is stubble burning? Second is uh, why is it that the people are going to burn these stubbles? And the third is uh, what can be some sustainable measures? Stubble burning refers to the burning of the straw in the paddy fields of a uh, northwestern part of India in Punjab, Haryana and western Uttar Pradesh. People, build the, uh, people burn these stubbles for a variety of reasons. Uh, the first is that one must understand that such type of stubbles are not burnt in the field in uh, Bihar, in Uttar Pradesh, where uh, most of this straw is going to be used as uh, a raw material and as a fodder for the livestock. But in these regions, it is not going to be used as a fodder for the livestock. One of the reasons is that they can't be used as a fodder for the livestock because uh, they are not at all tasty for the livestock. They are laced with good number of pesticides, their test is not going to be good, they are genetically uh, engineered, they are product of high yielding varieties of seeds. So only the fruit in this case is going to be useful, nothing else, nothing else. It's a huge amount of wastage because we have followed the western style of agriculture in India and that has literally destroyed the entire of Punjab, Haryana and western Uttar Pradesh. That has been the second component of it. Now the third component, why is it that people are going to burn stubbles in these places? Because eh, these stubbles eh, cannot be transported from farm to any other region. Now in order to tra in order to transfer them from farm to other places, that requires a huge amount of labor force. Now, while such type of labor force happens to be there in Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, it is not going to be in Punjab and Haryana. The third is, because the farming is capital intensive, consequently, all the farms are required to be prepared very fast for the next, for the next crop. Consequently, they are required to be removed as fast as possible. Now, there are two ways. You are going to bring a tractor, you are going to bring a machine and then going to remove it. The cost will going to become very, very, very high. Now farmers are not in a position to bear that much amount of a cost. Of course, what they are going to do is that they are going to burn it. The burnt up materials uh, do, uh, does go on to increase some amount of nutrient status of the soil. Of course, not to a large extent. Uh, had it been that they have been allowed to rot in the field, uh, that would have been much, much better. Because that would increase the nutrient status in a much better manner. 
Now that is stable burning. Now what can be done for a sustainable management? One of the reasons say, why this is not going to be good for the livestock is because it goes into being a very high amount of a silica content. And this silica content can't be managed except for the fact that, of course, the cropping pattern requires to be changed. That is one. And supposing that it does going to be having a high amount of a silica content, you will go on to have some of these machines that have been developed by the ICAR perhaps, which will go on to convert all of them into certain type of blocks of sorts. And these blocks can go on to be easily transported and they can be manufactured into paper. That is another part of it. The third is, of course, that requires a change in the entire of the practice of this region. It is the change in the farming practice that goes on to being significant from the perspective of making it a sustainable type of a solution. That is question number 12. Question number 13 is explain the advantage of Southern India has in terms of attractive destination for automobile industry. Explain the advantage Southern India has. There are three parts of it. The first part is why is it that Southern India is significant? Why is it that the Southern India goes on to be having a very favorable condition for the automobile industry? Now, the automobile industry, to begin with introduction, you have to talk about automobile industry spread is tuned throughout the whole of the country and that there are going to be four major belts. One of them is Delhi, Saharanpur, Gurgaon, Faridabad belt. The second is going to be Mumbai, Nasik, Pimpri and Pune belt. The third is going to be associated with the Southern Indian belt that is going to be comprising of Siripan, Parambadur, Valduvar, Marai Malai Nagar, then Hosur, Yelahanka, all of these all of these places which go on to be housing some of the best known automobile manufacturing centers. Now why is it that it goes on to be there? The first is uh, the availability of a high quality steel in the form of salium steel. Second is the port facility that goes on to aid the import of machineries uh, and export of the cars. The third happens to be the work culture in that place. Uh, so much so that even in a tropical cyclone one can go on to see almost like a hundred percent attendance in the in the manufacturing units. Uh. The fourth is uh, a vehicle testing range where uh, one can go on to take a vehicle, they can go on to allow it to jump a pothole, go on to go on a hillock and so on and so forth. Uh. There is a vehicle testing range. Uh. The fifth in this case uh, is uh, associated uh, with uh, the electricity, a very stable southern grid. The sixth is associated with uh, a very, very efficient, uh, very efficient uh, skill based uh, population in that region. The seventh is uh, a very good degree of a connectivity with the entire of the country. Now, these are some of these factors that has allowed uh, the southern Indian portion to be a very good attractive destination for automobile industry. Fourteenth is analyze the new trends in cotton textile industry in terms of market structure and organization which can change the complexion of uh, India. Now, it can this is a question that can be easily misunderstood for what we're going to be talking about uh, that is it's not about the location of cotton textile industry it's going to be the trends in the cotton textile industry in terms of market structure and organization so how is it that the cotton textile industry in the country is going to be organized what has been the type of changes that has taken place so cotton textile industry is a premier industry it has a it is generally going to be localized in a, several regions like Mumbai, Pune region is going to be one of them eh? and then it, Tirupur is another one of them, eh? Ahmedabad belt is another one and so on and so forth. Now comes to the trends, although there had been a lot of locational trends that have been available, off later eh, there have been some trends eh, which are going to be associated with the market mechanism and market structure and organization that are also visible. When we are going to be talking about market destruction and organization, it means first, most of these units are going to be integrated. That means you're going to feed only raw cotton and then you're going to get a finished product. That's one. Second is that uh, apparel industry has got itself integrated with the fabric industry. That's the second one. The third is uh, most of these units which are integrated will going to have a rayon, with going to have a weaving facility, with going to be having a waft and weaves in this case. Uh, the conversion, the dyeing facilities, everything going to be under one single roof. 
the fourth is that it goes on to be acting like an industrial complex that is the fabric from that unit goes on to be becoming input to the apparel unit now this apparel unit uh, goes on to be in a uh, five different tiers that is the one tier that that is the one model that has been developed by the zara by zara in uh, india so that the topmost floor is the one that is going to be for the pro processing the second is going to be for the purpose of sewing sewing the third floor is going to be for the purpose of uh, assembling all of these two units uh, the second floor is going to be associated with the finishing of the product uh, and the first floor is going to be for the purpose of the packaging of it and the ground floor is going to be its exhibition so in one integrated unit you're going to find everything converted from a fabric to an apparel that is uh, with respect to as uh, with respect to it second is that in terms of organization more and more units are coming up which can go on to be of a decentralized nature like khadi and village industry like uh, the manufacturing of uh, some real high quality clothes uh, which going to be required some degree of a real intricate embroidery of sorts in these areas uh, that is organization now it is these things uh, that is responsible for changing the complexion of the industry it has changed and it is going to be changing now this is what exactly is visible in the ravind mills uh, in uh, punjab haryana and uh, pan in punjab region which uh, it is ravind mills uh, that is manufacturing uh, almost all the jeans where it is wrangler which is levi's and all the shirts uh, that is going to be that is van usen louis philippe arrow or any one of them even peter england as well all of them have been manufactured in the single place uh, and uh, that has changed the complexion of the whole of the country that is question number 14 question number 15 is the development of ports uh, following the natural advantage of the western coast uh, also follows strategic consideration explain it in the light of geostrategic reality now the first thing is what you have to explain is what exactly is a geostrategic reality so geostrategic reality one of these forms of geostrategic reality is that that is a uh, China will go on to be breathing around your neck. The string of pearls is a reality. The relationship with uh, some of these countries in Iran and other regions that is going to be turbulent, uh, and that uh, you always require to be prepared for a war. You have always to be always always uh, you have to be very very uh, uh, you have to be very guarded of your national interest. Uh. now because a good number of chinese ships will now go on to start passing from gwadar to the arabian sea then they may go on to go to maldives which is what is one of these regions that the chinese are developing then may go on to go to colombo maybe chittagong and then maybe to of course hambant tota and then to chittagong and then to the malacca strait so that is a geostrategic reality we have to live with it we have allowed ourselves to be surrounded eh, by the chinese thanks to the policies of the congress government in this case eh? now how is it that the development of ports eh, following the natural advantage of the western coast eh, can go to follow these strategic considerations eh? western coast is very very well placed eh, with respect to the construction of the ports and evolution of the ports eh, because of many factors the first is that the coastline is indented the coastline is going to be indented embayed or dissected that allows natural harbors to form the second is the western ghats going to be running parallel to the coast to such an extent eh, that eh, some of these beaches and some of these ports eh, are really very well protected not the ports harbors are very 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 well protected they are well protected from tsunami largely because eh, you have a coast and then you have a, a small mountain range that goes into be running somewhere So 20 to 30 kilometers away from that place, and that these mountains will be responsible for the Western Ghats will be responsible for blocking any type of a larger tsunami wave that is bound to be coming into India that is affecting the Western Coast. That's the second one. The third is that the continental shelf is very very wide. That means we have a vast amount of resource that to cater to it. of course it's not very wide like that of the alaskan shelf eh, and the bering shelf eh, but it is still it is going to be wise enough uh, wider enough on that count eh. that's another part of it the fourth is that good number of ports eh, in this space can go on to be acting like a port of call like kochi can go on to act as a port of call eh, 
Vijin Jhang is acting, going to be acting like a port of call. Eh? So there are going to be a good amount of commercial interest that has to be taken care of. Eh? Of course, not to speak of Margao, Margao and eh, um, Navasheva as well in this place, but the southern portion will go on to have eh, a good number of port of call where the ships will go on to dock themselves, eh? people will enjoy themselves and then going to move on to a different eh, journey all in all. It is in this light eh, that we have two of these eh, naval centers coming up. One of them is going to Wellington Islands, that is Kochi, that's one. And the second is that is going to be coming up in about 10-15 years of time, that is going to be Karwar. That is eh, Asia's largest naval base in the whole of the region. This is going to be Karwar. Now, we are going to be talking about that is, uh, these ports go on to follow the strategic considerations. The development of ports uh, following natural advantage of the Western coast also follows strategic uh, considerations. That means uh, the construction of Karwar, the construction of Kochi, and then of course, uh, course uh, of course, uh, Vishakhapatnam, Vaisagya, and then Chandi Puransi, all of them uh, have a single point agenda. Chandi Purasi on sea and that of a uh, that of Vishakhapatnam going to open the entire avenue of India towards the southern portion because uh, towards the south of India there is no island, uh, nothing, and India can go on to look for all the way towards Antarctic as well. Western portion is going to be protecting uh, economic interests of India, it is going to be protecting Jamnagar, it is going to be protect, protecting Gujarat coast, it is protecting Kandla, it is protecting Mumbai, it is protecting Madagaon, it is going to protect protecting Kochi, it is going to be protecting Tiruvananthapuram, all of them. So, it has a strategic consideration uh, in the sense uh, that it will allow India's blue water navy to be extending away from this region, go on to patrol the entire of the Arabian Sea as well as a uh, protect the maritime uh, lanes of interest uh, of economy. That is 15th. 16th is uh, the advent of new mo means of intra-urban transport has uh, altered the spatial frame of cities uh, and more and more cities are being transformed. What are these transformations and what impact they have on the cityscape? Now the answer has to be associated with uh, three frameworks. First is uh, the meaning of uh, intra-urban transport. Intra-urban transport that means within the urban areas. A transportation form that is going to be within the urban areas. Now the second part of it is that it has altered the spatial frame of cities. Uh, that means uh, how is it that it has gone on to alter what is to be located, where it is to be located and so on the special frame of the cities and more and more cities are being transformed that means uh, because of it because of a certain type of intra urban transportation the special frame of the city goes on to get uh, transformed uh, and more and more cities happen to be transformed in one way or the other that is what exactly is being talked about in this case uh. now what are these transformations and how will they go on to impact the city is simplified. The opening of a metro and the introduction of a metro, is it going to be bringing about any change? Simplified, this is what this topic is. So the first part in this case is going to be the, the explanation of a, the intra-urban transportation. That means the advent of the new means of intra-urban transportation, that is a, something like metro, something can go to be maglev. It can be even a even a new type of bus services as well. There is a new means of intra-urban transport. Buses are not new. Metro is something that is going to be new. It has altered the spatial frame of the cities. And how is it that the spatial frame of the cities have been altered? What the metro stations have done is that they have created a new node in themselves. For example, if it is going to be taken it from an example from Delhi, which is the best place from where to take an example, then uh, it is because of metro that Connaught Place had got on to see its revival, so-called Rajiv Chalk and so on, that has seen its revival. That's one. New urban nodes have developed in these regions that goes on to include Hodgkas, and another is Dhala Kuma, another is going to be Akshardham. Now these are the type of new nodes that have come up. And uh, accordingly, new nodes will be coming up as and when uh, the, no the metro goes on to get itself extended to, no to, extend to Greater Noida, as well and all the way to Jiver airport at the same time. 
so that is going to be another another component associated with it okay so that goes on to have an impact on the spatial frame of the cities a new nodes are going to be picked up on. second is a that is the the concept of distance and the notion of distance goes on to change the third is a of course it goes on to increase the residential mobility of the population the fifth is that it goes on to bypass a lot of a rumbling traffic that goes on to be in the cities and that is going to be by and large very comfortable to move as well the fifth is that it is going to be far more predictable in comparison to any type of uh, individual ownership of the vehicle set the sixth is that it is going to be that is going to be more and more uh, associated with uh, associated with the opening up of new centers and so on so forth so there is going to be it has altered the spatial frame of cities and more and more cities are being transformed so which are the cities that are being transformed delhi has been transformed kolkata has been transformed that was the first of incidentally incidentally then uh, the third has been a uh, bangalore is now being transformed chennai is now being transformed uh, same is the case with uh, lucknow and in all of these places the transformation is going to be taking place in terms of the urban travel behavior so what are these transformations that is urban travel behavior is transformed nodes are being added shopping behavior is going to be transformed the metro station goes on to become a new hub where a good number of people will go on to hub knob with each other and uh, that is one of these places that is going to be made into something like an entertainment center as well where people can go to wait for certain things and it can go to become a joint of sorts so the already existing uh, cities they uh, go on to be developing a new node and that has a role in uh, making the city <coughs> polycentric so delhi was having some node mumbai was having some node and new nodes scape uh, will be coming up uh, and that has been the major impact on the city scape of uh, any region 17th is what role do starters have as a food loose industry in india and how will they going to impact the special makeup of india now the concept is what are startups what is the role that they going to play as a food loose industry in india one and how is it that they will going to impact the special makeup of india now startups are all of those type of businesses which start up with a high degree of a motivational level skill and so on and most of these startups go on to be donned by man by young entrepreneurs who are bursting with energy who are bursting with activity who are bursting with ideas and they are having a food loop they are having a having a completely spread out location throughout the whole of the country maybe there is can be a startup which can go on to be in a dibrugarh region which can go on to be in muzaffarpur which can go on to be in eta in uttar pradesh which can go on to be in tirupur as well and uh, no one knows that these startups will start doing so well it is not going to be necessarily confined to the metropolitan areas uh, because uh, the products that they are going to be aiming for the services that they are thinking of providing uh, the type of a uh, net to internet net, uh, that is the network that is uh, they are going to be using uh, all of them going to be having a major impact on how is it that they can go on to allow the industrial spread in the country to be taking place so all in all the concept in this case is because these startups are not only about manufacturing they are about a of course they are about industrialization of india in the sense that is industry is industrialization is a process of value addition to the to countries to economy and so on so forth that is about value addition and when we going to be talking about such type of value addition then essentially we are confining ourselves our talking about we are going to be talking about some components like that of a skill to attitude to management and for anything so one can go to start selling a tea in a different manner one can start making a making a product out of grocery products one can go to start talking about a the different type of pickles eh? one can go on to start talking about how exactly that they can go to renew the shoes eh? or maybe uh, all of those used eh? sleepers eh? now they can be a host of it eh? and that is not going to be following eh? any type of eh? 
conventional rule in this case hai neither conventional rule with respect to the location nor with respect to manufacturing not with respect to management nor with respect to its marketing hai nor with respect to the way the business is going to be conducted and since hai it is going to be picked up by anyone from any part of the country it is bound to lead to the decentralization of the economy so this is what is going to be the impact on india they will go on to allow the industrialization to take place decentralization rather it in this the malabar exercise offers a good chance for india to exercise its uh, domination in indian ocean without actually being a blue water navy so you have to begin by talking about what exactly is a blue water navy so blue water navy is a capability of any naval power uh, to have uh, its uh, entire of the fleet in the midst of the ocean including an aircraft carrier including uh, two or three submarines uh, including many frigates uh, including many destroyers uh, aided by a fleet of uh, airways uh, aided by the diplomatic channels say uh, through which you allow yourself to move into that region and of course uh, linked by the satellite technology which will go on to provide uh, you a linkage uh, through out uh, the whole of the world and and, and of course with uh, the diplomatic channel that you have newly developed uh, for allowing yourself uh, to go into a territory that is going to be under the eez of a different country altogether now india doesn't going to be having that type of a capability such a developed capability as a as a maybe united states goes on to be having it right now now still it has to fend its waters it still has to fend itself uh, and it is for this reason that uh, mindicos india was getting itself surrounded badly badly by the chinese uh, and uh, as we talked about that is the last uh, 10 years of a misrule of the congress and even before that uh, that has that has really taken a toll of india's defense capabilities uh, as well as the security of the country india requires uh, to to uh, assert itself uh, either by some alliances or something else malabar exercise was an exercise uh, in that capability so what malabar exercise did was that it brought in united states it brought in japan went to show to any of these enemy countries that were eyeing india to subjugate from any part, part from any angle and also strangulate it as well and uh, also arm <laughs> twist it at all that is we have three countries which are going to be taking together and we are moving into this territory all these three countries are uh, moving together all of these three countries are uh, exercising this power goes on to mean that uh, despite the fact uh, that india may not going to have a uh, aircraft carrier it can in the, by way of this exercise uh, by way of this association uh, it can go on to take care of uh, the chinese presence uh, maybe in terms of economy it can go on to take care of the japanese uh, because uh, india went on to offer the bullet train to the japanese uh, that has been said that has been of course perceived as one of these factors that may have angered the chinese uh, of course that is one of these factors there are a host of other factors uh, india is not going to be cowed down so soon so despite not having a blue water capability the malabar exercise goes on to show that india is capable of fending its own territory and uh, it will going to provide one type of an expertise japan will be providing one type of expertise uh, and united states will be providing another type of expertise uh, and how is it that they will going to coordinate all of these uh, events uh, how is it that they will be able to do it uh, is going to be a real 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 form of an exercise so malabar exercise offers a good chance for india to exercise its domination in indian ocean question number 20 eia must be made more simple more easily spreadable as a policy measure to check further environmental degradation now environmental degradation is first of all to be defined it is going to be about an unwanted type of intrusion into the environment because we don't know about too much of it it is the lowering of the quality of the environment that goes on to include all the components of environment that is uh, it goes on to include uh, the atmosphere the hydrosphere as well as the lithosphere so a degradation in the quality of all of them is what exactly is going to be associated with environmental degradation one of the ways in which environmental degradation can be going to be checked is uh, by way of environmental impact assessment yeah. environmental impact assessment is uh, the assessment of some very large scale projects like that of hydro power projects uh, thermal power projects uh, like uh, super malls uh, like uh, 
some of these type of new factories, eh, smart cities, eh, advent of smart cities and so on. Eh, it is these things eh, that have made it eh, very, very, very significant. Eh. This is what exactly that we are going to be talking about EIA. So environmental impact assessment is the assessment of all of these type of environmental capabilities. Now, as a part of EIA, when you're going to submit an EIA report, eh, you have to talk about eh, what exactly is going to be the impact of the proposed activity on the land, on the air, in the water, on the people, on the culture, on the birds, on the animals, eh, on the plants, on the flora, on the fauna, almost everyone. Now, having said that, eh, it, this report eh, can go on to be made eh, so manipulative and that can be made so bulky that it won't be possible for anyone to read it at all. That is, uh, if I have been uh, given a chance uh, to prepare such a type of an EIA for uh, uh, let's say thermal power plant that I am going to be establishing, uh, I am going to make it so bulky that it will going to run in something like 13, 14,000 pages of thoughts. Uh, that will going to run so bulky. And because it goes on to be running in 13, 14,000 pages, of course, uh, there is no one uh, who will go on to take a look at all of these reports. So, maybe that is that uh, the government goes on to pass through it, that will, will going to allow it to pass through it. That is going to be a possibility. And this is what exactly happens. Now, if it is going to be made more palatable, if it is going to be made more simple, then uh, people will also understand that these are some of the things that are required to be reported. The people will also going to understand these are some of the things that require to be expressed. And uh, of course, we're going to involve a lot of people. EIA, as so far, it's going to be very, very bulky because its manifestation is also sometimes in the form of a matrix sometimes in the form of a checklist method but the checklist is itself going to be so bulky that is going to be taking a uh, taking a real time maybe a six month of a time only to fill the checklist method moreover there is no way if uh, i going to i going to uh, train a report uh, that uh, there had been some 2568 uh, snakes in that region and only three had been killed by my project uh, that the government will ever go on to check it it's simply not possible neither will it be possible that i going to say that there had been a uh, some uh, some uh, 786.6 birds in that place uh, and that only seven of them have been affected still the government cannot go on to check that part that is not possible so it requires to be more realistic it requires to be more simplistic and the day it goes on to become more realistic, simplistic, with a good amount of a good a good amount of a participation from the people, public, politician, eh, then eh, it will going to be one of those efforts eh, in in checking environmental degradation. Not going to be the entire of it, but one of it. That goes on to bring us in question number twenty one. What are ophiolite assemblages displaying their origin evolution? Ophiolite assemblages are those type of assemblages where the plate collision that has taken place, eh, where eh, the ocean continent collision has taken place as it has been in India and the oceanic plate has been scrapped off eh, and the scrapped portion has gone to mix with eh, the sediments, it is mixed with the volcanic activity, it is mixed with the granitic terrain of that region. It has eh, led to creation of a certain type of assembly that is so chaotic. Eh, that it is really undecipherable. undecipherable. Now it is this complex, uh, it is this complex assemblage of a, a basaltic terrain that is uh, of the scrapped up portion of the oceanic crust, uh, then uh, the mixed up portion of the granitic terrains, uh, that is the sedimentary assemblages in this place, uh, and uh, a good number of uh, uh, a good number of uh, <coughs> Um, Uxine conditions that may have been present in those places, all of them going to get mixed up eh, to lead to the uh, the evolution of an assemblage that we're going to be calling it a really chaotic and that is what is called as ophiolite. Origin is, as we have talked about, of course it goes on to be dis discussed in detail. That is when the two plates going to collide, one goes on to go inside eh, and that the oceanic plate is going to be scrapped off. Eh. It is this scrapped of oceanic plate eh, uh, sorry, it is this scrap of the basaltic layer on the top of the oceanic crust eh, that eh, leads to its eh, evolution. This is how much is what exactly is the directive of the answer that can be given in this case. 
twenty second is going to be explain the origin version of the IT acid and its impact on drainage. IT acid refers to in this sample suture zone. That is, in the sample suture zone is one of the zones where the tibetan and the Indian plate has gone itself welded. That is what its evolution. They got welded because both of these plates went on to collide. Now that collision zone, that is the welding zone, that is also going to be the sign of a vertical thrust sheet that goes on to remain in that place. This vertical thrust sheet that goes on to remain in that place, that is ITS set, sorry, that we are going to be calling it by the name of ITS set, also goes on to offer, offer a pathway because it's a thrust sheet, because it's a fault, it's a crack, it also goes on to offer a channel direction it goes on to offer a channel way and that's what we're going to call it a impact on drainage so the impact on drainage in this case is going to be such that it will go on to have it it will go on to be allowing any of these rivers to move along that type of a track so if it is going to be Narmada, Son, Damodar, Liramant, then of course the Narmada, Son and the Damodar river goes on to move. If it is going to be in the Himalayan belts, eh, there are going to be two rivers that are going to be moving along it. One of them is going to be Indus that will go on to move towards the northern side. Another is going to be Sampo that will go on to move towards the southern side of it. Eh. That is what exactly has been the impact on the drainage condition. So it has allowed a passageway and a fault and a crack to allow this type of development to take place. 23rd is going to be discuss the origin characteristic of the green greenstone assemblages. To what extent are they significant? It's a small directive essentially. Greenstones have been in news largely because the government of India has offered itself offered its greenstone belt for exploration by the Australians. Now that is one of the reasons it can go on to be a question that can be asked in GS, it can be a question that can be asked in geography, both of them. What exactly is a greenstone assemblage and a greenstone belt? When the earth was in its initial stage of formation and it was having a basaltic ocean on the top of it, gradually this entire of the liquid basalt started cooling. As it went on to cool, liquid basalt turned itself into solid basalt. This solid basalt in due course of a time got itself metamorphosed. The metamorphosed version of basalt is called as green stone. The first layer of India or for that matter any continent is going to be made of this green stone belt. That's the first layer. So you have older green stone belt, then above it is going to be newer green stone belt, above it is going to be the peninsular Nisi complex in India and then above it is going to be sedimentary volcanic succession. Now these four layers, older greenstone, newer greenstone, peninsular Nisi complex eh, and eh, then eh, the sedimentary volcanic uh, uh, succession, together they go on to form what we are going to be calling as a peninsular basement complex. It is over this basement eh, that all the subsequent geological activities has actually taken place. So basement is formed. Now it is this basement that is floating on the underlying asthenosphere and above which maybe mountain building can go, maybe mountain will go to form or volcanic activity will go to take place. Anything that is going to be taking place that is going to be taking place on that. So we have talked about the origin and characteristic of uh, the greenstone assemblage. This is the origin and characteristic of it. To what extent are they significant? They are significant because they are the reservoir of mineral resources. They are the reservoir of a of any type of a mineral resource, metallic mineral deposits. So you're going to find a iron, cobalt, a chromium, manganese, gold, a diamond, what not, what not. It's only that you have to go deep or maybe in some places where greenstone is going to expose on the surface as it is in Greenland, then that goes on to make it easy. But of course, no one is going to be bringing this type of iron ore and other type of materials from Greenland so easily. So they are significant because they are the reservoir and they are the repository of any known metallic mineral deposits. That is 23. 
25th is uh, explain freight, freight equalization policy of government. How did it lead to backwardness of Bihar? Maybe it can go on to the question can go on to be in the form of how is it that it led to the backwardness of the country and regional imbalances. Now understand freight equalization what it is. Freight equalization as a policy for the first time it was dealt in a detailed analysis by Nandan Nilekani in his book Imagining India. Of course it was a policy which was there that was adopted but it was not made so public as it was made by Nandan Nilekani. <coughs> Freight equalization policy is going to be all about that uh, if coal was available in Bihar, if coal was available in Bihar at that point, undivided Bihar, that was, there was no Jharkhand at that point of time, then uh, this coal, if it was going to be transported to Gujarat, if it was going to be transported to Jammu Kashmir, it was going to be transported to Kohima, Naga, like in Maharashtra, then uh, it would have incurred some amount of a transportation cost. The transportation cost that we're going to be incurring, it would have made it uh, so uneconomical for some places like that of uh, Maharashtra or Gujarat or Rajasthan or Jammu Kashmir not to afford it. Now these countries, uh, these uh, states uh, said that is, uh, that is uh, in this case uh, Bihar will going to have an absolute advantage because it was of course having coal, iron or everything uh, and that the other regions will be, is, will be starved off. So a new equation was furnished, a new form was taken care of. That new form that was taken care of was a that was a that is the cost of transportation of coal or iron ore or for that matter anything from Bihar or any adjoining region will be calculated for the whole of the country. That means coal from Bihar to Assam, coal from Bihar to Nagaland. Coal from Bihar to Arunachal Pradesh to Aizol to Mizoram to Tripura to Rajasthan to Jammu Kashmir to Himachal Pradesh and all of part of the country. And then, then a median mean will be picked up, that is an average will be picked up to such an extent that that is an average price that has to be paid by Bihar as well as Rajasthan as well as, as, well as Maharashtra as well as Jammu Kashmir as well as Arunachal Pradesh. Now that was good for other states and that went on to become good but then in this case Bihar lost all of its advantage, relative advantage that it used to have with respect to availability of coal or iron ore or anything in this case. Now one of these regions that may have been uh, responsible for the backwardness of Bihar has been this factor. So Bihar lost its absolute advantage in this case. So Bihar had to pay as much amount as it was being paid by Maharashtra. Now Gujarat additionally had coast. Now because Gujarat had a coastal region, the, the any product that was to be transported through Gujarat, eh, of course Gujarat went into charge is demerit price. There was some type of an advantage that eh, maybe a place like Bihar, Delhi or other regions went on to have it, eh, but all in all that gave, gave an absolute advantage to some states like Gujarat and Maharashtra which with their port location were able to export these things from the hinterland of India. This was one of these factors that led to the backwardness of Bihar. Now we went on to pick up some of these questions of our unknown origin. There can be another of this question that can be a representative form of it that is trace the regional development plan for Chambal region that is question number 26. 26 trace a regional development plan. Now you may be asked to trace a regional development plan for northeast region, for Mizoram, for, for, for South India, for Himalayan region, for Himachal Pradesh. Now the trick in this case will be that even if you don't know the topic, the trick will be that Go on to take a look at uh, what are the advantages that uh, Himachal Pradesh has, Chambal has, uh, South India has, uh, maybe Arunachal Pradesh goes on to have. Now, once having known that, the best way to know this is uh, imagine the Indian syllabus. So, is it that they have advantage in terms of terrain, physiography? Is it in climate? Is it in vegetation? Is it in soil? 
Is it in water resources? Is it in mineral resources? Is it in energy resources? Is it in agriculture? Is it going to be industry? Is it going to be in transportation? Is it going to be in urban development? Is it going to be in any one of them? Now, the moment you start scanning the entire of the second paper of India, you will be able to find that uh, what are the advantages Chambal has. Of course, provided you have read the whole of Indian geography. We are only talking about trick in this case. Yeah. So, you will be able to know the advantages that the origin may going to have. For example, what are the advantages Chambal may going to have? So, Chambal goes on to be having a bad land. So, it doesn't want to be having good soil. So the first part task in this case will be the conservation of the soil. How is it that you can go to conserve the soil? You can go on to cover the whole of the Chambal region with a jute fabric. That is, it will be almost like a laminating the entire the Chambal region with a jute fabric. Now this jute fabric will go on to soak, go on to get soaked with the rain water. It will go on to become wet. And all of this rain water will go on to get itself soaked into the soil. And when it goes on to get soaked into the soil, then uh, it goes on to allow the soil to increase its uh, humidity. It goes on to allow the soil to increase its uh, moisture content. Now it is in these soils, then you're going to plant some seeds. Uh. Now seeds will start growing. Now as the seeds will grow, they will go on to provide aeration. They will be provided aeration by the jute packs, uh, the, by, by the jute fabric. Uh. And when they start growing up, they will go to break the jute fabric. And when they have grown completely, the whole of the jute fabric will be broken, it will be torn apart, and thereafter it will go on to get decomposed and go on to get mixed with the soil. So it will not go on to cause any environmental degradation as well. So it will go on to get itself green, the whole of Chambal region. Now, what all that you can go on to imagine? Chambal region can go on to be very, very good from the perspective because Chambal River, that is for tourism for ecotourism in that region, right? So one of them is going to be for the purpose of soil conservation, second is going to be for afforestation, the third is going to be for tourism promotion. Now, is it going to be for agriculture? You're not sure? Don't write it. Is it going to be for water resources? Yes, it can go to be for water sports, Chambal River, right? Is it going to be for anything else like that of industrial development? Now, think of it if you don't want to know jittery leave it apart is it going to be important from the perspective of a small town's establishment in that region maybe one can go on to think of it transportation of course this region requires to be connected with the transportation and what sort of transportation that is a it can be it can go on to be of course a railway line passes through it but roadways in network can be increased and more and more helipads and maybe small airport can go on to come up this in this region now, even if you have picked up four or five components and aspects of it, you will go on to find it easy to sail through. That's a case study on how exactly that, even if you don't go on to know any answer, how is it that you can go to frame it? That was all about some questions of unknown origin for 2017.